Kuru is, is preparing, um, I'll introduce him, he's well known to you since, since we arrived here yesterday, Morris Leeson, a psychiatrist and pharmaceutical physician by day, um, a, genea a genetic genealogist by night, he's administrator for the Leeson Spare and Far an Irish Caribbean DNA project and World War I Missing Legacy projects. He has organised the DNA lectures for Genetic Genealogy Ireland in Dublin. And who do you and the who, who do you think you are in the UK since 2012? As well as having travelled not alone here and in the UK but abroad as uh, giving lectures. I know he has connected people with their family um, through DNA. Uh, particularly people who were adopted or fostered. So, um, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Morris and he'll give us what I know would be a very interesting talk. It's a new area to, uh, that's available to us historians, so over to you, Morris. Great. Thanks very much, Michael. Great. Well, this will be the, uh, the uh, last lecture before lunch, and um, I'm going to give you lots to digest, so you might, even, you might not even feel hungry at the end of this lecture. Um, DNA in the Gleason plan, well this is available as a PDF document, these slides are available as a PDF on that link there on Dropbox and um, uh, like I say these videos are being recorded so they'll be available on YouTube uh, afterwards as well. Um, the Gleason DNA project began in 2008 when Judith Classen Gleason, my co-administrator, started the whole thing and uh, we've set up a um, website. Uh, at Family Tree DNA, that's the website there. We also have a blog associated with the project and I give regular updates on uh, the results of the project, the results of the study, and we also have a Facebook group <coughs> called the Gleason Genealogy Forum, which has uh, over 300 members now at this point in time. So we're very, very much into our genealogy and what I'm going to talk to you today about is uh, the results of the uh, Gleason DNA project and what it tells us about the Gleason plan. Now taking DNA itself is very simple. It's a, it involves a, a cheek swab or giving a sample of saliva. That goes into a test tube, that goes off to the lab, and in the lab they look at your DNA sample, uh, they uh, put it through their machines, they analyze it, and then they print the results on your own personal web page private web page protected by your own username and password. But not only do they give you your DNA results, they compare your DNA results with everybody else in the database. And there are a million people in the Family Tree DNA database and they will give you the email addresses and the contact details of the people that you match. And that is how you start your collaboration with these other people who are interested in their genealogy in the same way that you are. The other great thing about a family tree DNA is that it creates the infrastructure for all of us to start our own projects. So I have the Gleason DNA project, but I've also started the Spiron DNA project. I've inherited the Farrell DNA project, and I've inherited the Maloney DNA project, and I started the Boylan project. So I've started projects for all of my ancestors. I'm very selfish. And, um, and family tree DNA allows you to do this. Now there are three main types of DNA test. The first is the Y DNA test, which goes back along the father, father, father line, and that goes back about 200,000 years. On the other side of your family tree, you have the uh, mitochondrial DNA test, which goes back along your mother, mother, mother line. So they're only doing one of your ancestral lines. Okay, that's important to remember. One on one side of your family tree, one on the other side of your family tree. If you go back about 10 generations, you have about a thousand ancestors at that level. Ten generations back, a thousand ancestors. These tests will only be looking at one of the thousand ancestors on your father's 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 side and one of those thousand ancestors on your mother's side. So uh, the third type of test then is the autosomal DNA and that looks at all of your ancestors. But it has much more restricted reach than the other two. This one only goes back to about 250 years whereas the other two go back 200,000 years. And that makes the Y DNA test and the mitochondrial DNA test very good for deep ancestry as well as recent ancestry. And that's why they're used for migration studies. And if you see at the back of the hall there, if you're around the DNA table, there are some nice maps 
of human migration based on your DNA. So the father's line, uh, the mother's line, and all your ancestors. And uh, usually these tests cost $129 for the father's line, that's about 115 euro, um, 60 euro for all your ancestors, and 60 euros for your mother's line. But uh, at the clan, clan gathering today, we're uh, offering four Y-DNA tests at a discount, a $60 discount. We've sold two of them already, there's only two left. So um, make sure you come and see me uh, for your, if you're at least a man, uh, come and see me and I'll be able to give you a $60 discount and give it to you for 60 euros instead of 115. Um, also, is there any Gleason man here from Tumavara or one of the neighboring town lands? One, one person there? You think you're Tumavara and you've already done your test? Very good. Any other men from Tumavara or neighboring town lands? Okay, fine. Well, if, you, if anyone knows a man from Tumavara, grab him and bring him up to me. Um, we're also giving away uh, 10 free family finder tests. That's the one that looks at all of your ancestors. Six of them have gone already. We have four left. No, we have three left now. Actually, seven have gone. So if any uh, North Tipperary uh, man or woman with ancestry in North Tipperary is willing to, or wants to do a free family finder test, then please come and see me afterwards as well. Now, I'm going to talk to you about the benefits of the Gleason DNA project and what does it actually tell us about our surname and where it came from. Well, first of all, it can help you identify your family and where it came from. It can also help you connect with Gleason cousins and by doing so, you can possibly break through brick walls in your own family tree research. The other benefit is it can place you on the human evolutionary tree, the tree of mankind. It can date your surname, characterize its evolution, and define the branching structure of your genetic family. And we'll take a look at some of these. It can also help determine the deeper clan origins of your family. And I put clan in inverted commas because it may not necessarily be that your particular surname was ever a clan per se, or a sept, or a tua. Um, there's a variety of different uh, Gaelic expressions that one could use. And the other benefit of joining the Gleason DNA project is to contribute to the growing body of DNA research and the advancement of genetic genealogy. And uh, you'll see from what I present to you that the Gleason DNA project actually is there at the cutting edge of this new scientific research. So let's look at the first one. Uh, identify where your family came from. Well, these are my DNA results. They're actually my dad's DNA results, and I got my DNA from my dad. Um, so we got him to do the test, and um, these are his results here. And you'll see that we have a list of names, Little, Gleason, McLaughlin, Gleason, 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 McLaughlin. So we've got about seven names there. And we have the most distant ancestors over here. This one says the most distant ancestor is an unidentified Gleason. So this person here, Little, somewhere back in his ancestry, there's an unidentified Gleason. This could have been a secret adoption, for example. So this uh, little person did their DNA and discovered they didn't have little DNA, they had Gleason DNA. Um, going down through the list, we have somebody from Massachusetts, somebody who hasn't given a location, but this person down here says that they are from um, Doherlan. Kill him or kill. And I think that was one of the um, uh, questions that came up, David, uh, during the course of our discussions. Where is Kilimakil? And it must be somewhere near Boherlan, but Mike, you're going to talk to David about that, aren't you? Yeah. Great. Um, and this is the most important piece of information that you can have about the earliest known ancestor, is the actual ancestral location, because that helps um, anchor this group of people that I match in Tipperary. Now, this is what the results page looks like. So when you get your own results, that tells you something. It gives you a list of matches. But if you look at the project website, it, we're, as administrators, we group the DNA together. People with similar DNA signatures, we group them together. I don't expect you to read any of this. We basically have all the group members stacked up on top of each other, 
And those group members that have similar DNA signatures are grouped all together. So you can see in group number one, we have people with a line going down here, a line going down there, another line there. Just look at the colors. And you can see that there is a very distinctive pattern for group number one, or lineage one, as we call it. And that pattern is very, very dis different from the pattern for lineage two. And it just goes to show that these two groups have very distinct genetic signatures. We also have a group three, and again, you can see very, very clear and distinct genetic signatures. Each group has a different signature, but the people within the group all bear the same signature or very close to it. And we can say that all of these people in group number one are closely related to each other. In group number two, they're all closely related to each other, but not closely related to group one. And in group number three, all closely related to each other, but not related to group one or group two. And the interesting thing is, group number two, lineage two, all of them come from North Tipperary. Their earliest known ancestors of many of the members goes back to North Tipperary. In, in group number three, lineage three, all of them come from West Clare, the townlands of Core or the townland of Connolly. And in group number one, they go back to Suffolk in England. These are English Gleasons. Not only that, they go back to a named individual, Thomas Gleason, born in 1609 in Cockfield in Suffolk. And these Gleasons are all over New England. Massachusetts, Connecticut, all over New England. They've been there since 1609. They have proliferated. And one of the reasons why Gleason is spelled E-A in America rather than E-E, -E, uh, as we would do in, in, in Ireland, is possibly because of the influence of Thomas Gleason and his descendants. By the time the Irish Gleasons came over to America in the 1830s onwards, somewhere there beforehand, but mainly from the 1830s onwards, the name Gleason was already very well established. So when they arrived in Ellis Island and said, hi, my name is Gleason, I can spell it for you, they said, no, no need, I can spell that already, I know, it's G-L-E-A-S-O-N, fine. So um, that could be one explanation for why we have E-A rather than E-E -E in America. Now we do have a fourth group, and this is a US group, but we have an Arnold, a Gleason, a Gleason, and a Stanford. And um, they have said that there is an MPE in the family. In other words, a non-paternity event, uh, which basically is a technical term for meaning somewhere down the line there's been a switch in the DNA or a switch in the surname, uh, either through a secret adoption, an illegitimacy, uh, fostering, something like that. So they are Gleason's by name, but somebody else by DNA. And who, those, who the originator of that particular genetic group is, we don't know at this point in time. Lastly, and this is very important, we have a whole group of Gleasons who are not in any group at the moment. And the reason for that is because there are not enough people who have tested. And I'm quite convinced that we will find that uh, among our Gleason clan, there will be a multitude of different genetic signatures for one reason or another, and I'll show you some of those reasons shortly. And for that reason, the first people from, those, for that, from that group to test will be ungrouped because there'll be nobody else in the database that shares that same genetic signature. But as more people test, people are going to move from this large ungrouped section into additional groups within the project. So, for the moment, what we can say is that we have identified at least four genetic groups of Gleasons, North Tipperary, West Clare, Suffolk in England, and some place in the US, Ohio, is, is where two of those Gleasons come from, and there may be more descendants from that group as well. So DNA helps group people together, number one. It can identify a person's origin based on the earliest known ancestral origins of the members of that group. And it can also identify a person's ancestor. So anyone who does the DNA test and matches group number one, lineage one, we can tell them not only your ancestors go back to England, we can say your ancestors go back to Suffolk, your ancestors go back to Thomas Gleason, born in 1609 in Cockfield. 
So it's incredible what DNA can actually do. If you match anybody in the North Tipperary group, then that means that your ancestral homeland was North Tipperary. And we've had people joining the project who thought they were English, and then I write to them and say, um, think again, you're Irish. And they say, what? Okay, I'm changing my password to color me green. <laughs> so and that actually happened with one chap. So uh, DNA can be a very, very useful way for the diaspora Irish to actually locate a place in Ireland to commence their documentary research. It's a great tool for pointing you in the direction of further paper-based research. Now, we uh, mentioned NPEs, or secret adoptions. I like to call them either breaks in transmission, or a surname or a DNA switch. And it's because of this. We apologize for the break in transmission. Any of the local Irish will recognize this from RTE back in the 1970s. Um, apologize for the break in transmission. The surname or the DNA from one or both parents has not been passed on to the child. And this break in transmission of DNA or the surname down along that father, father, father line um, is, can be explained by a variety of different reasons. But this is an illustration of how it might happen. So for example, in this situation we have the normal transmission of DNA, this blue DNA, blue Y DNA is being passed down along the father's, father's, father's line, going down from father to son, father to son, father to son. In a situation where, for example, um, the wife is of higher social status than the husband, the family might take the wife's name rather than the husband's name. And a classic example of this is Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell was not Oliver Cromwell. He was Oliver Williams. But his grandmother, or great-grandmother, um, Catherine Cromwell, uh, Catherine married um, uh, Thomas Cromwell, who was um, a very big name in Henry VIII's court. And because um, she was a son of, of Thomas Cromwell, a daughter of Thomas Cromwell, and because her Cromwell name was more important, when she married a Williams, the Williams' children took the mother's name and became Cromwell rather than Williams. Sometimes they describe themselves as Cromwell alias Williams, or Williams alias Cromwell. And that mother's name was passed down through the ages to their descendants. So these people would have been Williams by DNA, but Cromwell by name. So that's one way that you can have a break in transmission of either the surname or the DNA down the father's 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 line. Another example is when you get um, foreign DNA being introduced. And so, for example, in um, Ireland, in the time of Gaelic clans, it was customary to allow your wife to couple with powerful people. Now, I'm still trying to get my head around it, but apparently Hugh O'Neill was the son of a named child. Because the, the, the tradition was then, uh, the wife on her deathbed would name who was the real father of the son. So Hugh O'Neill's father was a named child, and his real father was Turlock O'Brien. And on uh, her deathbed, his mother said, uh, the father of, the, of our eldest child is Turlock O'Brien. And that was important under Brehan law because that named child stood in line for inheritance from that powerful person. So in that situation, you would have a married couple, a powerful person coming along, and it was the powerful person's Y DNA that would have been passed on to that child. And that child would then have carried that Y DNA forward to his descendants. So this person might have been a Murphy by name, but an O'Neill by DNA. So that's another important way that we can get this break in transmission or this surname or DNA switch, also called non-paternity event. Uh, many different causes. Allegiance to the Lord of the Tua. So for example, the Gleasons, living in a country where there were very powerful Kennedys, very powerful um, McCarthy's down south, very powerful McMahon's over in Thomond, uh, they may have shown allegiance to their local Lord by taking his name. And all of their children then would have become Carols by name, but Leeson by DNA. Kennedys by name, but Leeson by DNA. So that's one way that the DNA could actually, uh, that the surname could switch. 
And this would have been very common with the uh, servants, the soldiers, the vassals, the tenants, the slaves of the powerful lord would take that powerful lord's name. Adoption, fostering, very important in Gaelic society, fostering, and guardianship would be other ways that the surname or the DNA could switch. And another common way would be if a young wood widow remarries, then her young children, who might be, what, one or two, three years old, they might take the name of the new husband. And therefore they become the new husband's surname, but carrying the old husband's DNA. It could be a legal condition of marriage that you change your name in order to marry my daughter. You will change your name to Gleason. Uh, or in order to her inherit my land, you will change your name to Gleason so that the name gets passed on to uh, your children. Uh, taking the wife's name upon marriage, we've talked about customary coupling with powerful people and the naming of children on the wife's deathbed, we've talked about. Infidelity and illegitimacy were completely different concepts under Brehan Law. And in fact, Brehan Law bent over backwards to avoid any illegitimacy at all. So, and women had much more rights under Brehan Law than they did under English law that came in in the 1500s and 1600s. So, uh, the way that we think about infidelity and illegitimacy today was completely different back a thousand years ago. Anglicization of surnames would be another reason for why you'd get a name change. For example, um, some Gleasons may have become Greens because uh, Gleason in uh, Gaelic is Glossoin, Gloss is green or grey in Gaelic and therefore it might have been anglicised to green. So um, we haven't found any yet but I wouldn't be surprised if we found some men called green who actually carry Gleason DNA. And there are other many causes of these uh, surname or DNA switches. And you have a 50% chance that the surname you carry today does not go back to the person who originated that surname a thousand years ago. So if you're a Gleason, you've got a 50-50 chance that your surname today, your DNA today, is not the same as the DNA who invented the name Gleason back a thousand years ago. Or O'Farrell, or Boylan, or Spiran, or Murphy, or McCarthy. 50% chance. Um, the second benefit of joining the, the Gleason DNA project is it helps you connect with Gleason cousins and break through brick walls in your family tree. So this is uh, lineage three, the West Clare Gleasons. And uh, you can see here that this is where they're located. Um, over here in, where are we now? That's Limerick. So the other Gleasons, where's Loch Derg gone? Loch Derg's going to be up here somewhere, isn't it? So it could be, oh no, no, it's a bit over this way. Yeah. So the North Tick Gleasons be down there. And this is where the West Clare Gleasons are. Now, uh, they've done a lot of uh, documentary research and they've come up with this draft family tree. They think that the originator is Cornelius Gleasons, who had two brothers, Matthew and John, and then there's a variety of more descendants and more descendants over here. And you can see that some of them have actually been DNA tested, these red individuals here. And what the DNA has shown is that they are all closely related to each other, and we can even draw a rough family tree for this group of people based on their DNA markers. And it looks incredibly like the, um, very, very similar to the documentary based tree that you see there. So these people are currently using um, a selection of, a uh, mixture of Y DNA and autosomal DNA to try and figure out how they are related. But just looking at the Y DNA and the mutations that they have in the DNA, you can see some of these mutations up here the little pink squares, a little purple square up there. These are all minor mutations they have in their DNA. And looking at these mutations, we're able to estimate when their most distant ancestor would have lived. And the rough estimate is about 1790, and you can see that that's coming relatively close to 1750, which is the estimated birth year of the patriarch of this particular West Clare group of Gleasons. So, they're using further DNA testing to try and uh, elucidate uh, the connections of this particular family. And that is how they are actively using the DNA uh, evidence as a tool to help their documentary-based research. Now, I've also used DNA in my own family to connect with Gleason ancestors. And I've talked previously, and you'll see some of my videos online, uh, and the mystery of the wedding memento is one of my favorites, and it deals with Ruby Kathleen Gleason. And uh, my dad, a couple of years ago, going through his grandfather's papers, 
found this wonderful, what he thought was a bookmark, and it turned out to be a wedding memento between David Patterson and Ruby Kathleen Gleason, married at Targo Minda, the 23rd of March, 1893. So we made some inquiries in the family. We didn't think that this was one of ours. And just before Ruby Kathleen was put in the shoebox and put underneath the bed, I said, hold your horses, let me do some research. And I was able to trace her grandson. It took me two years, but I was able to trace her grandson. He was 80 years old. Targominda is in the middle of Australia. So I sent him a kit in the post, and 18 weeks later, we got the results back, and it showed that my dad and him were second cousins by DNA. And that is what we would have predicted from the documentary evidence as well. Uh, the trouble was, of course, that uh, my great-great-grandparents were John Gleason and Anne Gleason, and his great-great-grandparents were John Gleason and Anne Gleason, and we could not be sure that there was the same John and the same Anne on both sides of the um, family. So the DNA was a great help, and by doing so, we were able to confirm and reunite the siblings, Martin M. Gleason and Ruby Kathleen Gleason. Ruby, who had been lost to the family since she disappeared to Australia in 1886. So that was a great way of using DNA to actually reconnect with family. Another thing that you can do with DNA is it can help place you on the human evolutionary tree, the tree of mankind. It can date your surname, characterize its evolution, and define the branching structure of your genetic family. Now, this is a very new science. Fifteen years ago, this was not around. And it was only really since about 2003 that we started looking at DNA and using DNA in, by the general public for commercial purposes. And back when we first started, we really didn't have that many markers. But with the markers that we did have, we were able to define 16 branches on the ore portion of the human tree of mankind. And the ore, ore branch is, is one of the major branches you'll find in Europe. And then in 2005, it increased to 24 branches, and in 2010 to 71, uh, and in 2013 to 290. And what is it now? We have more than 10,000 branches just on the ore branch of the human tree of mankind. And the Gleasons sit very firmly on one of those branches. In 2018, we're likely to have branches for each individual family. So the, 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 the progress of the science is advancing so quickly that it is very, very difficult to keep up with the amount of data that is coming in from all of these new DNA markers and all of these new discoveries. So this is what we're able to do uh, from a migration point of view. We're able to use genetics to look at how man migrated out of Africa at 50,000, well, we first arrived there about 250,000 years ago with anatomically modern humans. 50,000 years ago, a small group of Africans left Africa, spread out across the world, and populated the rest of the planet. It only took them 50,000 years, and this was the last place on Earth to be populated by modern humans, the tip of South America. And they came down from Asia across the Bering Strait, down through North America, down through South America. Now, there have been many other exoduses of humans out of Africa, but they all died out. So we are the survivors of the last exodus of humans out of Africa. And this uses the top-down approach, starting at genetic Adam and coming forward in time all the way to the present day, whereas we as genealogists tend to do a bottom-up approach, starting with yourself and tracing yourself back. But we're at the stage now where the upstream down approach of the um, population geneticists is meeting the downstream up approach of the genealogists. And with the Gleasons of um, Lineage 3, we've identified a particular branch of the tree that they are on, and that is characterized by a DNA marker called L226. And guess what? we have shown that it is likely, highly likely to be, the DNA marker of the Dalkash, Dalkassian. And the Dalkash descend from Cormacas, who lived in the 300s, and he gave rise to a variety of different branches. Some of them became Brennans, Muldownies, Hurleys, 
This one became O'Mara, Scanlon. This one was Kirk. This one was O'Kennedy, O'Regan. This one was Mac uh, McMahon. And this one was O'Brien. There is Brian Beru there. So Brian Beru was a descendant of the Cuss and gave rise to the O'Brien clan himself. And people um, with this particular L226 marker occur much more frequently in people with these surnames than um, any other markers or any other surnames with them. So we tried to do the same now with the Gleasons of Lineage 2. And last year we did some very extensive SNP testing with the big Y. And this measures 50,000 markers on your Y chromosome. And it gives you a much finer detail of the position on the tree. And this is what happened. In January 2015, we had two Gleason's tested, and they were lumped together with a Carol. So this would be three people with a very similar genetic signature. And our neighbors were Prendergast and Phelps, Creamer and Miller. That was January. April, we had uh, the Gleason's another Gleason joined, now we were separated from the Carol and we were in our own particular part of the tree which has three Gleasons and there was even branching among the Gleasons themselves. In June of 2015 we had five people in the project who had done this test. Again, two major branches of the Gleasons. There's that little person in there. She's got little, she's little by name, or he's little by name, but Gleason by DNA. Um, and then in October, we increased it to six people within the project, and we were joined by somebody called Glisson. And this was a really important part of the project, because uh, he was so distant from everybody else in the Gleason group that we almost missed him. But when he did the big Y test, there was no doubt that he was a very close relative to everyone else in the group. But we reckoned, and we did some time estimates, he branched off from the rest of the group around about 1200 AD. Now, that's incredible for two points. Number one, it shows that Gleason, in fact, is a, a variant of the name Gleason, number one. But number two, it shows us that the, the people in this group can say that their surname goes back to at least 1200. It's been in existence till at least 1200 possibly even further back than that. So that was a major step forward in our research. Then in June 2016, we had nine people in the Gleason group. We had two carols now as our nearest neighbors, Prendergast and Felp, Creamer and McCarthy, Miller and Tracy, and another Tracy joining as well. And in August, we have uh, the same thing, but in actual fact, the, a lot of the, the DNA markers have been given names. When they first come out, they're just known as a position, and then they're given names about six months later. So that's the current uh, picture of where the Gleasons fit on the human evolutionary tree. Not only that, we can date the branches. So this branch here was formed roughly around about 1125. This branch over here was formed roughly about 1050. And this branch here was roughly formed about 500 AD, or at least somewhere between 500 and 1000. So it's giving us an idea of how long the Gleason name has been in existence in the Lineage 2 group, and also where the various subgroups started splitting. The, it can date your surname, it can characterize its evolution, it can define the branching structure within the overall tree of mankind. But let's look now at the deeper clan origins of our family and see what have we found via the DNA and what would we expect to find and do they actually match up with each other and I think you're in for a few surprises here this is what we found okay you recognize this slide from previously we've got the four groups North Tip, West Clare, England and someplace in the US and we can put them into a table and there they are there uh, give the groups a nickname we've identified DNA markers for these groups We've also estimated the time to when they first came into existence. Uh, we've identified a, um, an actual named ancestor for one of them. We've also identified locations for these four groups. Is it a, a surname switch, DNA switch? Possibly with the West Clare group. Possibly also with, well definitely with the US group. Uh, possibly with the West Clare group. The uh, North Tipperary group could be a pre-surname clan connection. That could actually go back to the original clan that invented the Gleason name. 
but we need to do some further research on that. And um, uh, the West Clare group we've identified as being of Dalcassian origin because they have the Dalcassian uh, DNA marker. But that's what we found just so far. What would we expect to find based on historical evidence and the ancient texts? Now, there's a variety of different sources that we can use. These are some of the ones that I have used. Surname distribution maps, surname dictionaries, Wolf, McLeisus, and O'Hart. Some general sources, which have to be taken with a pinch of salt. Um, believe everything you read on Wikipedia and you're in trouble. Um, there's also a variety of learned texts, uh, especially Dermot F. Gleeson's texts and also Reverend John Gleeson's texts. David Austin Larkin has written about the Irish Septs in 2007. Academic journals, there's many of them uh, for this neighborhood. And then the ancient annals themselves, uh, the Four Masters, Linea Antiqua, uh, the Celts Project from UCC, Bartiaski's work uh, from uh, 2000, and Liawer Morn and Anelok, the Great Book of Irish Genealogies, um, written by McFirbishig uh, back in about 1650 and published by Omarila in 2004. And that's been very, very um, uh, revelatory as well. But we know from surname distribution maps, and this is Griffith's valuation of the 1850s, and there's the Gleason's, big blob of Gleason's over North Tipperary. No big surprise there. They've been around for a long time. If we go back 200 years to the 1650s and Pender's census, and this is just for the titulados, the titled people. Again, we're seeing a very, very high concentration in North Tipperary. So from that, you'd think the Gleasons came from North Tipperary and they didn't come from anywhere else. That's what I thought. Well, um, what I found from the surname dictionaries was some support and then something that threw me sideways. Wolf talks about the Gleasons being a descendant of Glosson, a diminutive of Gloss, meaning gray. Um, he also says they're in Cork, Limerick, Tipperary, and Kilkenny. McGlyce says <coughs> that the name in Kerry is Glissane, and they're located in Lower Ormond, which is very close to where we are today. Um, then McGlyce uh, expands on that in his Irish Families book to say that they belong to the Ara, which I take it to be an ancient uh, tribe, and I don't know much about them, um, in the country in County Tipperary between Nina and Loch Derg. Uh, also the Barony of Ara, and um, he says that they were originally from Muskery in County Cork. But not only that, he talks about Mach Ibrian uh, Ara's country, so we have an associated surname that the Gleasons uh, now live on what used to be Mach Ibrian Ara's territory. Does that mean the O'Briens and the Gleasons were in close enough proximity for a surname switch or a DNA switch to occur? Will we find Gleasons by name, but O'Brien by DNA, or O'Brien's by name and Gleason's by DNA. They also say that they are of the same stock as the O'Donoghans, and that's very interesting. Does, by the same stock, does that mean that they are genetically related to the O'Donoghans? It's a further clue. They're not Dalcassians, says Dermot F. Gleason, says McLeisid, rather, and that is something that is echoed by Dermot F. Gleason but in contradiction to the Reverend John Gleason, who thought that the Gleasons were Dalcassian. So you have to be careful with what you read, and one of the challenges is that the information is, just, is over, uh, all over the place, and you have to try and pull it in and collate it. There's no sources mentioned for MacLeasons. You can get them from the National Library of Ireland, but you have to go searching for them. Now I want to tell you about the Gleasons of West Ulster. Patrick, uh, Reverend Patrick Wolf talks about Mac Glashin, um, or Mac Glashin being the son of Glashin, or Glosson, a diminutive of Gloss, grey, green, a West Ulster surname. And in actual fact, there are still some McGlashans in the 1911 census. So, uh, is it possible that some McGlashans became Glashins, and some Glashins became Gleasons? We don't know at this point in time. We need to get DNA from those people. Also, there's a group of Gleasons in East Cork, where, uh, where uh, Wolf says that they're a descendant of Glasheen, the name of a family who were anciently seated in the barony of Immokili, but long dispersed through Munster, now very rare. O'Hart echoes what Mac uh, Wolf says by saying that uh, O'Brogan is considered the root of Brown, O'Glasheen, Glashen or Gleason, 
O'Mactire and O'Keeley were chiefs of He Makala, Immokili. Okay? Um, now the barony of Immokili in the county Cork. So this looks like to be another separate genetic group, but we need people from East Cork to do the DNA test to find out if that is true. So do we have three distinct groups of Gleasons? North Tipperary, East Cork, and then Ulster, a descendant from the Dalafiathuk. How likely is a multi-origin surname? Very likely, because the word gloss, meaning gray or green, could be applied to virtually anything. So there could be a green thing in Cork, a green thing in Tipperary, a green thing in Ulster, just springing up and people then being called the green thing or the green man or the little green man, which is a bit worrying. Were we leprechauns? I'm not sure. Um, gloss on being the diminutive, but also both gloss and gloss on are used as Christian names in ancient Gaelic uh, tribes. So if you look at the index of Lera Morden and Aelok, you'll find Gloss and Gloss on there as Christian names, as forenames. So it's quite uh, conceivable that the, the name Gleason arose in many different places. But how did it evolve? Is it a case that there was one group in Muscury County Cork of the same stock as the O'Donogans, who then moved up to Ara in Tipperary? Uh, are we looking at a mass migration of people? And then the people in Imokili, associated with O'Brogan, Brown, O'Mactire, O'Keeley, did they move over to Muscury, and then from Muscury, did they move over to Ara? Are we looking at a mass migration of one genetic group? Or are we looking at two or three possible origins and two or three possible distinct genetic groups? That's where the DNA is going to help answer that question. So now we can put in a table that the Gleasons were probably of Muscovy, and we've identified two additional groups, the uh, Ulster Gleasons and the East Cork Gleasons. Trouble is, we know very little about them. We know where they came from, and everything else remains a mystery. No DNA, no information. So we definitely need to... We definitely... Has this gone off? My battery is gone, so I'm going to use the battery in the other two. Back online. So we need DNA for, we need more Gleason men to uh, do the, the Y DNA test in order to answer uh, these questions. Um, I also went into the Hour Morden and Nailock. Now, here is the clan connection to Ulster. And if you read up here, the five sons of Daemon, Kingan, from whom is Kinnail Kingan, Glossom, from whom is Kinnail Glossom. So these are the Ulster Gleasons. They are Fir Ullad, they are related to the Dal Fiatok. That is their particular clan. And that is the lineage described in the uh, Great Book of Irish Genealogies, ending up with Glossom, uh, from whom Canel Glossom is derived. And if this is true, there should be similar DNA signature among the related names. So you see here the Day Mon had uh, five sons. If this is correct, the descendants of those five sons should match our DNA signature. Maybe not very closely, but they should match the DNA signature of these Ulster Gleasons. So whatever surnames derived from these five sons of Day Mon, we need to find out what surnames derived from them and then test those people. So that <clears throat> is a, uh, an ongoing project. Uh, but we have no Ulster Gleasons tested at the moment, no distinct group has been found, and there's no evidence as yet that the annals are true. But at least we have a template for how we would go about trying to prove it. Similarly with Cork, um, in Lerwar Morden and Aelok, it says Glaeson, from whom are the E Glaeson, son of Gwain, son of Mestal, son of Urhula, uh, Dovdal, Tua, and Conora. And I've been in touch with Cathy Swift, Dr. Cathy Swift in the University of Limerick, who's given me some help with this. But these were descended from the, the Imakela, so there's your Imakili uh, connection, a sept of the Ilia Horn, and a sept of the Dora Kerba. Um, but the related surnames are O'Donagan. So O'Donagan is coming in here in relation to the East Cork Gleasons. So now we've got MacLeisick talking about them being of the same stock as the O'Donagans, but I initially assumed that that was in relation to the North Tipperary Gleasons. But now it's beginning to look that the O'Donagans might be related to the East Cork Gleasons. 
Um, O'Dwyer is another name that's associated with these East Cork um, sept, and O'Regan, apparently as well, but that is taken from Wikipedia and that source needs to be double checked. But it gives you an idea of how we would go about proving whether the East Cork leases, if they are a separate genetic group, whether this um, clan lineage of this ancient annal is correct, we'd look to see if there was a genetic connection with O'Donovan's, O'Dwyer's, and O'Regan's. And that would help support the contention that the annals are actually accurate. Because a lot of the time they weren't. They were massaged for political purposes to make sure that, you know, I want to be related to so and so, so can you put me in the annals, please? Here's a fiver. Um, so there was that kind of uh, shenanigans going on with the ancient annals. As yet, we have no East Cork leasons tested, no distinct group found, no evidence in the annals uh, that the annals are true as yet. Um, the North Tipperary leasons. Now, this is interesting because uh, we have the North Tip genetic signature. McLeisett says that they had origins in Musgrave County Cork, the same stock as the Donegans, as we saw. Uh, Reverend John Leeson says they were Dalcassian. Dermot F. Leeson says no. McLeisett says no. Larkin says they're of the Clan Concorb Ara sept and they're associated with Bally Glishan near Bally Roan in County Leash. So again, a lot of these texts are not sourced, so you cannot check the references. So this is part of the ongoing work of the Leeson DNA project to actually try and just decipher what you can from this wealth of information. Uh, Dermot of Gleeson uh, states specifically that they descend from the pre-Celtic race of the Muscrigi, or the Aron, or the Ara, and the associated surnames are Malochny, Fihili, Ohogan, the non dalcassian branch, and Burkery. Uh, but there's no mention of O'Donogans in Dermot's book. That's very interesting, and that's in relation to North Tip. So it's making me think that the O'Donogan connection is East Cork, and not North Tipperary. So, the signature has been established for the North Tip Gleasons, but no evidence the annals are true unless, huh, unless, you saw probably on one of the first slides that my dad matches somebody called McLaughlin and McLaughlin. And I'm wondering if they are varieties of Malochny. Malochny, McLaughlin, McLaughlin. That's just a theory, and it just strikes me that there is some similarity there between those particular surnames. So that is something that is uh, uh, ongoing uh, investigation. So that's where we are now, and we can add into our table that the Ulster um, uh, group has a possible clan origin with the Dal Fiatuk, and the East Cork group has a possible origin with the E Liahon. But the O'Donogans possibly are a link between Cork and Tipperary. Further documentary research is needed, and I would really need to do a PhD or have somebody else do a PhD to get all of this information out. And there's not enough men tested yet from East Cork or from Ulster, uh, but there's no evidence the annals are true or not true at this point in time. If the annals were true, what percent of Gleasons would you expect to share the clan DNA signature today? More than 50%? Less than 50%? Here are the O'Briens. Only 13% of the O'Briens have the O'Brien DNA signature of L226. Similarly with the Kennedys, only 6% of the Kennedys have this DNA signature. And it's the same for some of the other families. If you look at the people with the actual surname, 90% people, of people with um, the surname O'Brien have that signature. 50% um, of the cases have that signature. But if you look just at the DNA, 13% of people with the DNA are called O'Brien, 6% of people with the DNA are called Kennedy. And for that, to me, means that the DNA has found it terribly difficult to trickle through to the present day without a surname switch or a DNA switch happening for whatever reason along the way. The vast majority of people will not possess the DNA signature of their originating clan, some clan DNA will have filtered through, uh, but it'll be a relatively weak signal. And because it's a relatively weak signal, many men will need to test their Y DNA in order to detect it. So that's what we would expect to find in the DNA results based on historical evidence and ancient texts. And what do we actually find? Who are we related to? 
Who are our genetic neighbors? You've seen this one before. Gleason's here. We've got Carol's over here. Prendergast, Phelps, Creamer, McCarthy, Miller, Tracy, and Tracy. The thing about this particular project is that not everybody in the database was included in it, so I had to go searching for other people. This is how we might be connected. Could be a pre-surname plan connection. It could be an ancient surname switch. Maybe the McCarthys were showing allegiance to the Tracys, and um, they became Tracy, Tracy the well, the Tracys were showing allegiance to the McCarthys and became McCarthy by name, but Tracy by DNA. Um, and the same with these recent ones, Phelps and uh, Creamer might be more recent uh, surname or DNA switches. And of course, you can get ancient uh, surname switches going back uh, into the pre-surname era as well. So I collected uh, a couple of other people who were in other projects and loaded them into this current diagram, and I ended up finding that the closest relatives of the Gleasons are still the Carols over here, and there's now four of them, <clears throat> followed by the McCarthys and the McManus. And then we've got Pendergast and Phelps, Creamer and Miller still in there. But how did we actually get these names? Did they come from the McCarthys down south, the McMahons up north, uh, the O'Carrolls were up there in uh, Ely O'Carroll. So these are names that did occur in the vicinity of North Tipperary. Uh, Phelps, how do you explain Phelps? Phelps is not an Irish name. Phelps is found most commonly in Gloucestershire, in England. And I thought, well, how could this possibly happen? And then I found this. Thomas Phelps, a Cromwellian soldier from Gloucestershire, was granted land in the counties Tipperary, Kerry, and Down. And when I went online to see where these townlands were, this is Killis Gully, here is Silver Mines, and these are the ten townlands that he was granted, and that's where my great grandmother lived. So my great grandmother lived on the land that was granted to Thomas Phelps. What did he do with it? In 1820, he sold it to Lord Bloomfield. That is Lord Bloomfield's estate. And the likelihood is that when I looked at the Phelps DNA project, there's a whole group of Phelps that have this DNA signature <coughs> excuse me, that either came from at least in a Carroll or McCarthy and McMahon, and they're all over in the US. The likelihood is that one of Thomas Phelps' son or grandson ended up um, having a DNA switch with a Gleason or Carroll or McCarthy, and uh, those descendants have now gone over to the US. So it may have been a Lady Chatterley's lover situation where the gardener was a Gleason, uh, for example, and um, Mr. Phelps gave his son um, uh, the Phelps surname, but the son was Gleason by DNA. So that's a very interesting uh, discovery for that particular association. Um, the surname Bell comes up in that group of people who are close neighbours, genetic neighbours to the Beesons. And um, his particular results go back to a Percy Bell born before 1912 in New Orleans, Louisiana. That is Gleason DNA or Carol DNA or McMahon DNA, North Tip DNA. What is it doing in Louisiana? And why is it in an African American man? How did an African-American man end up with a Y DNA signature from North Tipperary? Possibly somebody from North Tipperary went over to America and had relations with an African-American woman. Now, what the context of that relationship was, was it pre-slavery, was it post-slavery, we don't actually know. But this was another fascinating discovery about one of our very close genetic neighbors. The Carroll surname. Well, the Carols in that particular group that you saw, those four Carols, belong to this larger group, and they seem, there are 16 members in the group, it's well established, it's not a recent NPE, it's not a, an adoption or uh, illegitimacy. <clears throat> Three of them are from Tipperary, one from Kilkenny. How old is it? Probably pre-1300s. Proximity to Elio Carroll is very tantalizing, as is Ossery, but why should there be a genetic connection between the Gleasons and the Carols? I still don't know. They're, they could be Carols by name, but Gleason by DNA, but why would they do that? 
So Gleason DNA, maybe some Gleasons said we're going to show allegiance to the Carols and we will take the Carol name, but of course it's the DNA that persists in their descendants. And the same is possibly true of the McMahons, again a very well established group of the McMahons that we, we uh, match. Um, Again, it could very well be that a group of Gleasons said to the McMahons of Thomond in nearby Clare, we will show allegiance to you by adopting your McMahon name, but of course all their descendants had Gleason DNA. Similarly with the McCarthys, and again this is a bit more difficult to work out because there's only four people in the group, and it's, it should be probably two groups. Uh, because they branch uh, about a thousand, maybe a thousand five hundred years ago. So this is a little bit uh, more difficult to uh, decipher. But again, the McCarthy's uh, kings of Desmond, um, largely in Cork and Kerry now. But again, there may have been some surname or DNA switch back in the mists of time. And in actual fact, the, the creamer that you saw there as a neighbour was actually McCarthy Creamer or McCarthy Creamer, and the uh, administrator of the McCarthy project. Um, has now found documentary evidence to show that the gentleman called Creamer was actually of the McCarthy Creamers. They dropped the McCarthy name and just became Creamers instead. And that's how you get the association of a, a new surname with that uh, pre-existing DNA. So this is maybe more likely how we're connected. A lot of allegiance to other clans allegiance to the McMahons, allegiance to the Carrolls, allegiance to the McCarthys and possibly some recent um, uh, non-paternity events with Phelps and also with Bell. So it's very interesting how the DNA can tell you uh, these various things, but we need more historical research, more Gleason men to do the DNA test, we need more associated surnames to test in order to determine whether or not the ancient annals are correct or incorrect. And those are the benefits of the Gleason DNA project. And of course, this is all contributing to the growing body of evidence of, uh, of research, DNA research, and the advancement of genetic genealogy. And uh, like I say, there are uh, some free and discounted tests available today. So if you are interested in testing, please do see me. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Morris. That's fascinating. Uh, Bringing science to, to family research. Bringing mud to mud. No, no, no. It's, it's something that's basically in its infancy, I suppose. It's, yeah. it's just, it's, a, it's the future way forward. Uh, we probably have exhausted all admins and all papers are very near. I'm so, exhausted anyway. Well, I know the people here. The people are. are um, Will we have any, any questions for Morris because lunch, yeah? One or two questions and then we'll break for lunch. So you can catch me during the lunch hour as well. <coughs> Hi Morris, uh, I recently had my DNA done, as you know. Um, will a, a lame man like myself be able to work out the lineage uh, from the results or will I need an expert to do that? Well, as administrator of the project, I would probably tell you, uh, I'd give you a rough um, analysis of your results, so I'd send you a report. But um, the project is, is really quite a collaborative effort, even though I'm the administrator for the Irish side and Judy is looking after the English leases. There's a lot of project members within the group who are also helping me out. So Lisa Little has helped me out quite a lot and uh, various other people within the group are very, very um, instrumental in trying to decipher this, uh, this wealth of information and data. So it's something that we will get to the bottom of eventually. Also, uh, you said that uh, the website will give you contact details of your cousins. Yes. Um, how far back in the cousins? Second cousin, third, fourth, fifth, sixth? Oh, well, with, with uh, some of these cousins might go back to the 1200s. So you saw when that Mr. Glisson joined the project, he wasn't connected to anybody before 1200 AD. So the common ancestor between Mr. Glisson and the rest of the project members goes back 800 years. So uh, because Y-DNA has such a far reach way back, 250,000 years, it's, it's the sort of cousins you get with Y-DNA can be a lot more distant than the ones that you get with, say, the autosomal DNA, which only goes back about 250 years. Does all this DNA stuff um, kind of 
demonstrate some clear uh, demarcation line between pre Norman and Norman? And, and yes, because the, 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 the Normans have their own particular genetic signature. Frequently, not all the time, but frequently. Um, and to, to in, so, in some circumstances, you can draw a clear line between what is Norman and what is not Norman. You should know that anyway from the name. So, like, you know, Burke, De Burke, that kind of thing, and Barry. You know, so there are some very, very clear cut Norman names. But the DNA would also help differentiate whether you are genetically Norman or genetically non Norman. In, in the majority of cases, yes. Yeah. We have one more question. I'm conscious of lunch, and people are sure. here now, but this gentleman has one more question, and then people can talk to Morris. Morris sure, I'll be up there. Down here in the corner, he's around the, he's around the weekend, so one more question, and then we can take a break. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I'm sorry, David, that's good. I'm not going to get all your research. I'll be able to do it while I'm asking. Sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, Yes, that's it, yep. And her, her uh, uh, genealogy tree will be handled by Brian Gleeson and like that, but she was the uh, product of Richard Gleeson and Harriet Lyser. Harriet Lyser was the product of James Lyser and um, <coughs> Harriet Green. Harriet Green came from somewhere in England. My recent research shows that possibly James Lyser was the illegitimate son of James Leo and Margaret McRyser, who was born at Chan Golden and baptised at Old Patrick in 1823. Where did I start? If you think that there has been an illegitimacy in the family, or you, your grandfather doesn't know who his father was, um, the best thing to start with is the autosomal DNA testing. Well, the best thing to start off is, first of all, do your, your, your family tree and document it as best you can, as far back as you can. Then do your um, autosomal DNA and then test a cousin who is also descended from that same ancestor and get them to do their autosomal DNA. And any matches that you and your cousin have in common with each other will be related to that common ancestor and the ancestors above that. And that way you might be able to decipher who were the parents of that illegitimate or adopted ancestor in your particular family tree. Great. Well, thanks very much, everybody, for your kind um, attention. Um, I'm conscious, we're conscious, we're trying to make a decision here. We're way, way over time. Um, any suggestions from the rest of our committee here of what we should do? <laughs> three, well, three o'clock and pause the, the um, Edwin Deason talk. There's some excellent talks after dinner. I wouldn't go for a big lunch, you might fall asleep afterwards. <laughs> I often found that when I go to beekeeping conference, a heavy lunch, and you're, you're not off in the afternoon. So get a breath of fresh air, anyhow. It's up to yourself what you wish to do, whether you want to go for a lunch or a pint or. The centre around the corner is a supermarket, yeah. so you can buy sandwiches there. And Nora, what are you saying? There's tea and coffee at the coffee bar, and there's scones and cake as well at the coffee bar. So, we reconvene at 3 o'clock for another excellent programme. Thank you very much. <laughs>